we say boldly, we are not ashamed of the good news of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation. Kind of start off our day like that. And um, I was thinking now about we're beginning the season of fasting and prayer. And uh, as we begin the season of fasting and prayer, each time we fast, fast and pray God does something supernatural and I wanted to just help you just to understand we do 40 days of prayer during those 40 days of prayer those days are it's if you want to fast you can it's not really we just get together as a church to pray and that's normally around about September it's the, the period of tabernacles and the reason that we do that is because it's the beginning of, it's the, we're recognizing it's the Jewish time of the year of tabernacles, it's the beginning of their new year. And really what we're wanting to do is pray and prepare our heart before we get to January so that we're not setting our goals and our objectives before. So as a church, as a leadership team, so that you know what we do, we go away as a group, as a leadership team before the end of the year to pray and say, God, speak to us what shall we be doing in the new year? And that's where the Lord spoke to us that before the end of last year, for the beginning of this year, to put up our slogan, love your neighbor. So our verse this year is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and your neighbor as yourself. And so that's really the theme of what we're all about, is putting God first. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind. Give everything of yourself to God. And then when you've done that, then love your neighbor the way you love yourself. So turning it around, if you're loving God, you'll be loving yourself. If you love yourself, you'll be able to love other people. So the importance of us this year, or one of the things, our main focus is to reach our neighbors that we haven't reached with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and bring our neighbors to the house of the Lord, see them saved, healed, set free, and then discipled, equipped, and powered, and release them back into the world. So our whole motivation, what I want you to do during this period of fasting and prayer, and I'm going to share the word with you in a moment, but during this period is not only to bring your own prayer requests, but to target a neighbor, a specific person that you're going to pray for, and then set up a strategy how you're going to win them. I was leaving the building last night, and as we left, one of the gentlemen in the church came up and he said, my brother was in church. And I said, well, will he be back? He wasn't sure. I said, I'll tell you what, set up an appointment where we can have dinner. Well, it won't be during the fast, but set up a time when we can have dinner, and then I'll take your brother, and we'll go to dinner together. So my goal is to share the good news with this gentleman's brother because he came to the church, hasn't yet made a commitment to the Lord. So I said, well, let's have a dinner together and then uh, we'll talk about the goodness of the Lord and see him and his whole household come to the Lord. So set up a person in your heart right now. Let the Lord speak to you. There may be a neighbor next to you in your house, somebody you're working with, but our goal is to see someone born of the Spirit and for you to just stay with them. Sometimes we're trying to win 20, 30 people, but just get one individual, stay with that person that God's put on your heart and bring them into the kingdom of God and let's see what God will do in and through you this year. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, go with me in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Daniel, to the book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 3, we know in the book of Daniel that the three Hebrew boys, when they have been captured, and you read about them in chapter one, they had set themselves aside, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they set themselves aside to fast. And the kind of fast they went on was they said, we won't participate of, men's, of the king's delicacy. 
So at the beginning of the book of Daniel, we discover that these three Hebrew boys are being taken captive into Babylon. And when they are taken captive into Babylon, you'll find that out of their captivity in Babylon, psalms that were written were, how can we sing a song of praise to the Lord? They, they, the psalmist said, by the rivers of Babylon, uh, we hung up our harps. We couldn't sing songs of joy or of praise because effectively they were slaves in a foreign land. And the king looked for the best and the brightest. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were given to the eunuch, and the eunuch was the king's servant, and the king's servant had to ensure that they would be properly trained, and if not, they would be removed, as it were, from a select group of young men that the king was looking for to be able to change the nation. And so Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, they say to the eunuch, who's the king's assistant, they say to him, look, we don't want to eat all the delicacies of the king and eat what you're eating. We want to set aside the delicacies, set aside the meat, and uh, they basically ate fruit, fruit and vegetables, and they said we want to just have the basic food that is healthy food. That was their decision. And they said, if after 10 days we are not better, if after 10 days you test us and we don't pass the test, then we will eat the king's delicacy and eat the way they eat in Babylon. Now, bearing in mind, these are Jewish boys, so it would have meant that they were eating pork and offal and all that type of stuff, which it was forbidden, and duck and prawns. And so to the Jewish people, a number of animals were eliminated from their diet because they were considered unclean. Well, why would they be unclean? Because it was all the animals that were scavengers. So every animal that is a scavenger is basically eating the waste of the earth. And so it's not necessarily healthy to eat. And so they said, all right, what we will do, and that's why the Jewish people eat kosher. That means they hang their meat so there isn't blood in the meat. And uh, the animal has to be slaughtered a certain way in order for the food to be kosher, to be pure of all impurities. Uh, and so this is their culture, the Jewish culture. Now they make a commitment and they say, what we will do is we're safe with fruit and veg. We'll eat the fruit and veg, and if we're better after 10 days, then you allow us to determine our own diet so that we are not committed to have to eat of things that God forbade us to eat in the Word. So they go on this 10-day fast or just a fruit and veg fast, a partial fast, and on this partial fast, what takes place at the end of it, they find out that they are smarter, they are brighter, they are better, and when they brought before the king, the king says, these guys are really bright, I want them in my court. It's out of this first decision that they make that Daniel gets promoted, becomes a prophet in the nation, and he outlasts three kings, and he becomes a spokesman even to the new kings who come into the country. He is the one who is able to tell Nebuchadnezzar, if you don't honor and worship God as the only true God, you'll be turned into a grazing cow. And that happens to Nebuchadnezzar. He finds himself in the field for seven years until his mind is restored. The king becomes insane. And uh, it's all because Daniel is in the court. He is the one who, when King Cyrus comes in, the, the king says, you're not supposed to pray. But he gets up and he prays, and each day as he prays, the king's messengers see it, and even though there is an edict or a law against prayer, he's not allowed to pray. He gets arrested. He gets thrown into prison with lions. The lions' uh, mouths are shut. And the next day he comes out of prison. And once again the king says, your God is the only God. And he is the one who is to be served. You see, God has put you in the earth to be a sign and a wonder. It may be something as simple as food. But what he did was he said, I want to sacrifice something that costs me. 
You see, a sacrifice costs you. I said this last week that um, a young man was preaching in the church in California. He was preaching about the fire of God. And I was just listening because it's very difficult to preach about an experience in the Spirit unless you've had it. And so I was just listening, and uh, I thought, oh, okay, fine. And uh, I was getting to the end of the meeting, and I'd been asked to pick up the service at the end. So uh, whenever you pick up a service at the end, you, you want to be respectful to the person who's gone before you to take some of what they've said to tie it together and uh, not to go on a different track and preach a different sermon. So I was sitting there and saying, Lord, uh, um, how do I tie this up? How do I tie this up? And I had all these different ideas, but because the young man was preaching on fire, and then the Lord spoke to my heart, and this was what he said. He said, every fire needs a sacrifice. And I said, Lord, what are you saying? He said, well, if you go back to where Abraham was asked to offer Isaac and put him on the altar, that was a sacrifice, and every sacrifice requires a fire. And so I began to go through the Scripture and recognize that in the Old Testament, when an animal was sacrificed, it was burnt with fire. And so eventually I preached myself into a corner, and I'm not going to go through all of that this morning, but I got myself into a corner where I thought, well, the fire in the New Testament and the sacrifice, it stopped. What am I going to tell the people? And so I'd gone through all the Old Testament. Every fire receives a sacrifice. Jesus says in the New Testament, if you, when he comes into our lives, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Any branch that doesn't produce fruit, I chop it off and put it in the fire. So I was like, oh, I'd gone through all the scriptures, and now I was kind of stuck because there were animal sacrifices. And it was at that moment the Lord said to me, well, Jesus was the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. And I said, well, Lord, where was the fire? He said, at Calvary there was the wood. The Lamb was crucified on the cross, but the fire came on the day of Pentecost to receive the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the earth. You see, when we come into the presence of God and we fast and pray, it is a sacrifice, and it ignites a passion and a fire of the Spirit on the inside of us, because instead of sitting around the table and being hungry for food, we hunger and thirst after righteousness, and we hunger for God. So here's Daniel a little bit later in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 3, and this is a little bit later, and it's with Darius, another king, not Cyrus, this is under Darius, and um, the, verse 3, it says, then I set my face towards the Lord to, take, <clears throat> to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O oh Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. Then he says, we have sinned and committed iniquity. Now notice he hadn't sinned. Daniel hadn't sinned. But he was looking at the entire nation, and he identifies with the nation. And that's what we do in fasting and prayer. Our purpose of fasting and prayer is not to say, you sinned, my neighbor's a bad person, and, and, and I love my neighbor, and, and they, they've got a filthy mouth, and they misbehave. That's not our purpose. Our purpose is to identify with them and pray for them the way we would pray for ourselves. So Daniel begins to lay out a pattern here, and he says, we've sinned, we've done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and judgment. Now go across to verse 20. He's in a time of fasting and prayer. He says, now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sins and the sins of the people of Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of God, yes, while I was speaking and praying. Would you say it with me? Speaking and praying. Say it with me one more time. Speaking and praying. A lot of times when people pray, their mouth doesn't move. 
How can you have a conversation with God if your lips don't move? And the favorite verse for that is, be still and know that I'm God. There's a time to be still. But when you're praying and supplicating, you're acting as a lawyer, you're standing in the gap, you are crying out to God for someone else. So you can't be praying. You know, it's like as soon as you get into worship, people become passive. It's the same thing. In praise, people jump everywhere. You get into worship and everybody goes. Like Buddhists or Hindus. It's like... I call it Christians on weed. Worship isn't passive. Worship is an aggressive act of love. Worship is the deepest expression of love. When you're in love, even in a relationship and in a marriage, you don't go into your bedroom and you're there with your partner and you go, hmm. You don't do that. Well, what are you doing? Well, I just worship you. No, there's a deep expression of your love. There's an outward expression of your love and your passion. Worship was never designed to be passive. Worship was simply designed to make God the object. And so praise is about me, but worship is about God. Worship is how great he is. Worship sings to him. Worship honors him. Worship is never about me. Uh, you, you, uh, any song that has I in it is not about God. I exalt you, that's praise. Any song with an I in it, because you are putting yourself into the song to say, look what I am about, and look what I am doing, and, and I just want to praise you. And God says, fine, I'm happy about that. But worship sings about his greatness, his magnificence, his power, his awe, his ability to answer prayer, who he is. It lifts him up, and it's the attitude where John said, I must decrease, and he must increase. So when we fast and pray, we're saying, I must decrease, he must increase. It's not about me, it's about him. It's not about what I do, it's about what he does. So Daniel, in his season of fasting, in prayer in the mountain, he says, I was speaking and praying, and Gabriel, who I saw seen in a vision, because your eyes get open during a time of fasting and prayer, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me, and he said, oh, Daniel, I have come forth to give you skill and understanding. It's interesting that the answer to his fasting and prayer was not a miracle. His answer to fasting and prayer was to increase Daniel's ability to deal with the circumstance. So the purpose of fasting and prayer is God increasing the gift and the talent and the anointing and the blessing that is on your life to increase the skill on your life, to increase the understanding in your life, to increase the wisdom in your life, to increase the God-given ability in your life. And so notice he says this, he says, and at the beginning of your supplication, the commandment went out, and I came to tell you. Notice it's interesting that you are greatly beloved, therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. Notice before God gets into these big revelations, the first thing God does in a season of fasting and prayer is not only to increase your skill and understanding, but also to say to you, you're greatly loved. Oh my, hallelujah. I mean, really, do you love yourself the way he loves you? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and your neighbor as yourself. You can only love others to the degree you know you loved. You can't love until you know you've been loved. And the more you've been loved in the presence of God, the more you can love. And we become mean because we actually don't feel loved. He says, stop loving on me. I've got grandkids. So when I get the grandkids, I grab them and I'm just like, mm -hmm. now stop it, papa. And I just grab them and just kiss them all over on the neck, blow on their neck, blow on their tummy. I'm just like, mm -hmm. and I'm <clears throat> with my little grandson. 
swimming. And while I'm swimming, uh, actually it was swimming, and then in the jacuzzi, and there are other people in the jacuzzi, and the people are looking at me, and every time he comes past me, I'm like, give him a kiss. And I tell him, I love you. You are the smartest boy on earth. There is nobody brighter than you. There is nobody better than you. There are other boys who do well, but you are the best. You are the bravest boy. You are the strongest boy. You are the most intelligent boy. And, I t- and his mother said to me, you're pumping up his ego. I said, no, I am doing what God does for you, and I, I'm telling him how much I love him, and I can never tell him enough how much I I love him. And so when we begin to fast and pray, this is what God does. So he says, what I did, I came to tell you, you greatly. He didn't just say you loved. He said you're greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter. And then he explains to him a vision. And the vision is of the coming of the end of the age, the last days. And so as we begin to fast and pray and set ourselves aside to fast and pray, one of, one of the things Jesus began his ministry with fasting and prayer. You'll notice before his, cru- his crucifixion, he's in the garden praying, and he's pressing into God. Jesus takes 40 days to fast and pray. And it says after he had fasted, the devil came and tempted him. So you'll find many times when you begin to fast and pray, uh, it's not about your physical body. What you're actually doing is challenging principalities and powers. And the enemy always comes when you're weaker. And so if Jesus needed to begin his ministry with fasting and prayer, how much more we ought to begin to fast and pray. When you get into the book of Acts, you'll find them fasting and praying, and we'll talk about it a little bit more next week. But you'll see a couple of key things, and I want to just touch a little bit more on prayer. Pastor Benny shared on prayer. I want to encourage you to get all of Pastor Benny's messages uh, because it's a word not just from him, but a word to us as a people and to the church. And so you'll notice in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 11 and 12, when we're looking at prayer, we are commanded to pray. Prayer is not just something we do. Uh, It says, seek the Lord in his strength, seek his face evermore. So prayer is a definite pursuit of God. As much as he loves us and he pursues us, prayer is pursuing God. If you want something, you pursue it. I wanted to marry Wendy, so I pursued my love for her. And when I went to her house, my pastor didn't like me. He called her father and said, keep that young man away from your daughter. I didn't care. I just kept going back and going back and going back and going back and going back. Her father came out the door one night and looked at me and he said, if I tell you to get my daughter home by 11 at night, I mean 11, not 10 past 11. And I just said, yes, Pastor Fred. I got her back then at 10 to 11 because I was pursuing her and I didn't want to make her dad mad so that he would lock the door and lock me out. So when you're seeking God, you're pursuing after him because of the love relationship. And so he says, seek him, seek his face. Now notice when you seek the Lord, the Bible, that verse also says when you seek him that you are strengthened in seeking him. Sometimes in fasting and prayer we feel weak, but in actual fact you're becoming stronger. What do you do while you're seeking it? Remember his marvelous works, which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. Remember what God has done. One of the most powerful things you can do in prayer is rehearse in God's ear the things he has done for you. You say, Lord, you remember when I was sick and you healed me. You remember when I was running away from you and you convicted my heart and I became born again. You remembered when I didn't know what to do. And you begin to remind God of all the good things. Put him in remembrance. When you remind God, God gets excited. There's one of, you know, Pastor Benny is talking about the anointing, but one of the keys to the anointing is reminding God of his goodness goodness. There there was a song they sang in Sunday, Sunday school, when I remember what the Lord has done, I'll never go back anymore. 
when you remember what the Lord has done, you'll never go back because the goodness of God is so great, you have no reason to go back to something that is worse because you remember his goodness, you remember his love. And so you'll see it says, remember his marvelous works, 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14, 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14. Firstly, in prayer and fasting, we're pursuing him. Secondly, in fasting and prayer, we are humbling ourselves. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. It takes humility to pray. It takes humility to get into a church, and people don't do this in church anymore and kneel. Generally speaking, we come in, and everything's going on, and everybody's talking, and we're kind of hanging out and hitting the coffee shop. But it takes humility to kneel takes humility when you go downtown into the parade or into a public place and kneel. It takes humility when you're on the airplane to open up your Bible and read it and you're surrounded by people. I mean, you know, a lot of people, oh, I got on my iPad, I'm an undercover Christian. But it actually takes humility. People say to me, Pastor, never you carry a Bible. Well, because it still has the most powerful effect on individuals. When you walk into an elevator and I've got my Bible like this, they see Holy Bible. The whole elevator just goes, ah. You know, people don't know. Generally speaking, uh, they hold the door open and, how are you? Have a good evening. Have a good day. Generally, in most, most places. But you walk in with a Bible and it's like, <clears throat> there's, a, there's an uncomfortable atmosphere and you're not saying a word and you smile, hello, how are you? And, and, and they, they don't know what to say to you. They're not sure if you're some kind of religious or not because the Bible has a way of speaking uh, even when it's not speaking speaking, even if it's lying on your desk in the office, it has a way when people see Holy Bible, it has a way of speaking to people. Now the Bible says we are a written word written by the finger of God. So we as a people are a written living word read by all men. Hallelujah. Not just the book, but we are a written walking, talking Bible. And so they could get it both ways. So when we pray, we're humbling ourselves and we seek his face and we turn from our wicked ways. And he says, I will hear from heaven and forgive their land. And believe me, our land needs to be healed. How many of you know our land needs to be healed? We can continue the foolish fighting that we're having, but our land needs to be healed. Our land needs to be cleansed. There's been too much bloodshed. There's been too much violence. There's been too much rhetoric of, of nation against nation and tribe against tribe. But the Bible says where there's unity, God commands his blessing, and we want our land to be blessed for everybody to get what they deserve, for God to bless you according to your inheritance. There's not a problem with that. God will get your land, get your house, get whatever it is where there's unrighteousness. A righteous judge, it says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? He'll take care of you. But when you rely on the arm of flesh, you'll fail. But when we begin to fast and pray and say, Lord, you know about the land issue. You know about everything. He'll get it done. So notice in the book of Psalm 105 verse 4, Firstly, we understand you pursue God. Secondly, in pursuing him, you humble yourself. Thirdly, you'll notice this in Psalm, 100, uh, Psalm 105, verse 4. Seek the Lord see, and his strength. Seek his face evermore. So we notice earlier on when we pray, strength comes, but it says seek his face. The face means put your face in God's face. There's something about getting up in somebody's face. Uh, I don't know how your conversations go, but it's very difficult for me when I talk to someone and they don't look at me, you know, and you look like that in their eyes, because the book of Proverbs says the eyes are the windows of the soul, and so when you look at somebody and they're like, their eyes are there and they're on their phone, I'm like, hmm, you know, in me I'm going, hmm, I don't know so much, they're not interested in what I've got to say or there's something else going on. Uh, Wendy will tell you at dining room tables where that happens, I just get up and leave. And she says, why? I just say, well, it seems everyone's busy. 
But I found an intense conversation. I was talking to a gentleman recently, and I was looking at him across the, the, the a table, and he was looking back at me, and I looked straight into his eyes. He looked straight back at me, and I looked at him. And then I, I, I went, was with another friend, and this friend said to me, so what is this gentleman like? I said, he has a very clear look. He has a very straight look. He has a very intelligent look. I believe he's a righteous man. He said, how could you tell that? I said, I looked in his eyes, and when I looked in his eyes, his eyes are the window to his soul. I can see all the way down on the inside of him. So when you look into the face of God, he's not only looking into you, but you're looking into him, and what's in him is coming into you, and you're able to see. You remember when Moses came down off the mountain, he said, God, let me see your face, and God said, no, you can see my clothes. And when he came down, his face glowed to such a degree he had to cover it with a veil. And the Bible says people couldn't look on Moses' face because he was transformed. He glowed like a glow worm, in other words. Then the book of Corinthians says, if the glory in the old covenant was glorious, how much more the glory in the new covenant? Therefore, what the Bible is saying is that the presence of Jesus in you, when you fast, when you pray, becomes so glorious that when people look on you, they can see the glow of heaven, the glory of God. It's not the Johnson's baby oil. It's not the face cream, but there's a glow about you. There's a joy about you. There's a youthfulness about you. There's something, and people will look at you and say, there's something about you. And you, you don't know there's something about you. There is something about you, which is the presence of Jesus, but there's someone in you, which is the presence of Jesus. And Jesus who lives in you is looking out through your eyes. And if you've been looking into his eyes, the look that he had will be the look that you have. Watch anyone when the anointing comes into the, in the service and God begins to move in a certain way, you'll see their countenance and their eyes change. People come and get touched by the power of God. You'll see when they leave, it's like something changed because you cannot encounter God and look into his face and not change. You can't come out and be like, yeah. What do you want? No, you come out, and there's joy unspeakable, full of glory. There's peace like a river. There's answers to prayer. You come walking out saying, I, I've, I've just been with Jesus. The world becomes a little irrelevant. The, you you kind of become a little bit spacey. People look at you and think, this guy's kind of tripping out a little bit. He's been smoking something. You haven't been smoking something. You've been in the glory cloud and the presence of God in your time of fasting and a prayer. So when is the time to pray? Notice Psalm 5, verse 2 and 3, and we're going to move you just quickly on this psalm. You'll say, when do I pray? Uh, psalm 5, verse 2 and 3. It says, my voice you will hear in the morning. When do you pray? In the morning. My King, my God, for to you I will pray. Notice verse 3, my voice you will hear in the morning. Notice again, he says, my voice you will hear in the morning. I will direct it to you. I will look up before I look down. Amen. Psalm 88, verse 13. Psalm 88, verse 13. Psalm 88, verse 13. In the morning, he says this, but to you I've cried, O Lord, and in the morning my prayer comes before you. In the book of Daniel, chapter 6, verse 10, you'll say, well, do I only pray in the morning? There are other religions that pray, some of them up to five times a day. But Daniel, we notice, he prayed three times a day. Now, when Daniel, he said, I knew the writing was signed, and he went home in his upper room. This was the, where the writing was signed that if he prayed, he'd be thrown into the lion's den. So he said, when I knew I could be persecuted for praying, he said, then I went and prayed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What would we do tomorrow if the government said we'll persecute you for praying? Daniel said, well, when I knew I was going to be persecuted for praying, I said to the government, get lost. I'm going to pray. 
and I'm going to open my window and not close my curtains so you can't see me, but I'm actually going to open my curtains so you can see me, and I am going to pray because the same God that delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace is the same God that will deliver me from the mouth of the lion. I'm serving a God of miracles. I'm serving a God who will take care of me. So when he knew it was signed, he went to his upper room with the windows, opened them towards Jerusalem, knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom. May I ask you, what is your custom? Do you have a custom? We all have appointments. If you don't have an appointment book, you have appointments on your phone. My phone has alarms. <laughs> you know, why we call them alarms, I don't know. But it has a signal that goes off to tell me an hour before an appointment that I need to be at the appointment. Wendy gets really upset because she hears the phone going, ah, can I, can I? she says, what's that? Oh, it's reminding me of that. What's that? Oh, it's reminding me of that. What's that? It's reminding me of that. And, and so with cell phones, it got a lot worse before you just wrote it in a diary. But now I, I, I put it in, and there's a buzzer that goes off and warns me. And then I go, oh, I've got to do that. Oh, I've got to do that. And the other day it was going off, and I was like, just I was doing something. I was like, I delete it, delete it. And then it came back every five minutes. It kept coming back. I, I was like, I wanted to stab the phone. Uh, because I was like, I, I know, I know, I'm going to be there on time. But it kept reminding me. Well, here with Daniel, he made an appointment. Maybe you need to set a time where your cell phone goes off and say, time for God, time for God, time for God, time for God. Book an appointment with God like you book an appointment with your bank manager. Book an appointment with God like you book an appointment to put your car into the car dealership. Book an appointment with God exactly the same way. If you don't, you'll never have time with God. And you just politely say to whoever it is, I have an appointment. You're not lying, you do. You have an appointment to talk to the God of heaven, and you begin to talk and spend time in his presence. So notice he prayed three times a day. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, how should we pray? Not only three times, it says without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. So you'll notice morning, three times a day, what God, what's God taking you from? A prayer time to a prayer life to a time now you're walking in the grocery store and you're communing with God and you're and you're pushing your cart around and you're throwing in the meat and the veg and I know it's like we're fasting, but you're putting the, the, you know, the juice and whatever into your cart and you're and you're, you're communing with God and your heart constantly talks to Him. There comes a time in your prayer life where it's not just a prayer time, but there's ongoing communication. With Wendy and I, there's ongoing communication because of the devices. So the phone will ring, or it'll vibrate, and I go, oh, text message, it's Wendy. Uh, send a message. Vibrates again, oh, she replied. Send it back in. You know how it is. And that's how God deals with us. Because when you communicate, he answers. You communicate, he answers. You communicate, he answers. You say, how come I'm not getting any answers? Because you switched off. If you switch off the device or put it in airplane mode, to say, I'm just flying, then no signal can reach you. So your heart is the device that God speaks to. And if your heart is switched off, then you'll be switched off. If your heart is somewhere else, you'll be switched off. But as long as your heart is focused on God, you'll find that God is constantly communicating and talking to you. And there are things that just come to you. And you say, what happened? How do I know that? Because the God of heaven just spoke to you, and you know it by the Spirit. So we pray without ceasing, and then we pray purposefully, and I'm going to end there today in John chapter 14, verse 13 and 15. Prayer is about asking and receiving. It is vocal. In John chapter, in John chapter 14, verse 13 and 15, in John chapter 14, whatever you ask in my name, his name 
is the power of attorney. Whatever you ask in my name. What did he say? I will do it that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Why does God answer prayer? Because every answered prayer gives glory to God. When there are unanswered prayers, God doesn't receive the glory. But when there are answered prayers and you have a testimony and you say, I prayed and God answered, then people say, the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. People begin to bless the Lord. They get excited because they say, I prayed and God answered my prayer. And Jesus said, ask, because if you don't ask, then obviously you don't have a request. And they go on to the next verse, and you'll notice he says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And then you'll notice chapter 16, chapter 16, verse 24. Chapter 16, verse 24. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be filled. Notice he says the Father gets glorified, but why are we told to ask in prayer? Because God doesn't want any miserable children in his family. He wants to answer your prayer. And when your prayers are answered, there's joy. You see, why, why, would, why would God want to leave you depressed, suicidal, sick, sleepless, tormented? He said, until now, you, you didn't ask. I was with Dr. Fred one day. He was talking to me about something. And I said to him, well, Dad, you know, I was explaining something to, to him just about what I was doing in the church. And he gently rebuked me. He said, did you ask God? I said, no, he, he, he knows what I have need of. Because there's a scripture that says he knows what I have need of. And before I even pray, he knows. But he said, but God told you to ask. I said, yeah, I know he told me to ask, but um, I just didn't. He said, well, maybe it'd be a good idea for you to ask. So I did, and God answered the prayer. And then I realized when I read this verse, the reason that God answers is that your joy might be filled. So when prayer is answered, we go away rejoicing in God. We go away celebrating the goodness of God. We go away saying there is a God in heaven and He alone hears and answers prayer. Stand with me this morning. There's so much in the, in the Scripture on fasting and prayer. But the most important thing is to make a start to make a start. If you've never fasted before, then prepare your body before then. Say, how do I do that? Yes. Maybe use a, a product that will help just clean your body out. And then begin to drink water, just water only. Now bear in mind, people say, I'm fasting chocolate. I'm fasting TV. That's not a fast. That's not a fast. <laughs> fasting chocolate. Fasting TV. But when you fast, you draw aside from the things that occupy your life and you let Jesus occupy that space. So the times that you're just hanging out doing nothing, or just watching some TV show that means nothing, you take that time for the Lord. Say, Lord, I'm just laying aside all my own interests, putting them down one side. And if you're going to fast, if you have, I just need to share this. These are just practical things. If you have a medical condition, don't just throw your medicine away. There will be a variation in your system. When you begin to fast, your sugar level increases to begin with, and then it settles down. 
that's just at the beginning because your body starts to burn. Then, then people say, well, I'm going to lose muscle. No, you're going to lose fat. The first thing your body will do is burn off fat. For the first time now in the history of man, uh, no one ever wanted to research fasting and prayer. But a man just won a, a Nobel Peace Prize for showing the benefits of fasting. This is a secular individual. Finally, somebody did research and said there is a benefit. Your body in 72 hours completely resets itself. It takes 72 hours and your body completely resets itself. So everything in your body begins to reset. The telomeres, everything in your body start to get new life. So in the first two, three days, it's normal. People say, well, I've got a bit of a headache and I've got some aches and pains. Well, you're having withdrawal from Coke. You're having withdrawal from coffee. You're going to go through withdrawal from sugar. Hallelujah. Amen. You go through withdrawal. You literally go through withdrawal, just like a drug addict. You go through withdrawal. And, then, and you're like, ah. you, just, you say, well, Pastor Nev, so some... Sometimes the church, we're really funny. We pick on the drug addicts, but we drink more coffee. We drink canisters full of it. We're full of caffeine and Red Bull and everything else. I'm like, ah. <laughs> And then when we just start to drink water, our body starts to crave. And, and you get aches and pains. Just drink lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of water. You'll find after three days, your hunger leaves you. And then fasting is easy. After three, three, it's easy. And you'll find uh, the first day, the day of beginnings, the third day is the day of resurrection. Your body begins to resurrect itself. The fourth day, your heart will begin to cry out for the things of the world. Uh, by the fifth day, you'll find that grace, favor begins to enter into your life. By the sixth day, because the sixth day was the day in which God made man, you'll recognize that you have authority over what Adam and Eve never had authority over. The thing that got them into trouble was they ate of the fruit of the garden. You'll recognize you have authority over your mouth. And if you can control your mouth, you can control your future. Because death and life are in the power of the tongue. And it all began by eating of something that God said don't eat. The seventh day means that it is a day of rest and you will find your body begins to enter into rest. You'll find your sleep real easy. Your mind becomes supernaturally clear. The eighth day is the day of resurrection and you'll begin to sense new strength and new life on the inside of you. And as you progress from the eighth day to the fourteenth day, because the fourteenth day is two times seven, but as you move towards the fourteenth day, you find your body becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. You'll find when you go to twenty-one days, normally between the 14th and the 21 day is when spiritual warfare takes place and it becomes a little bit more difficult because Daniel had to persist 21 days until he had an answer come from heaven. You'll find once you get past 21 days and you start to head towards 30 days, from 21 to 30, you say, Pastor, how you know? Because I've done this. When you go from 21 to 30 days, you'll sense a second infusion of strength and of energy. And although you'll be skinny, you'll feel as powerful as a giant. You'll find once you get over the 32nd day and you're heading towards the 40th day, that becomes the most difficult period on earth. But that was the period in which Jesus' ministry was launched and he was launched into the future. And when he came back off the 40 days past, the Bible says his fame went throughout the entire earth because he conquered the devil by saying to him, it is written, it is written, it is written. And when he came out of the wilderness, he came out, the Bible says, in the power of the Spirit. When you come out of a fast, you walk out of it in the power of the Spirit with authority over demons and oppressive spirits. Hallelujah. I know I've gone quickly. I wish I could have spent time more on each and every day what transpires. But when you fast and pray, what we're saying is, Lord, the very thing that gets us into trouble in my mouth, I'm bringing it under control. The Bible says, this mouth is like a rudder in a ship. It's a little thing, but it can turn the whole ship. So it says we put 
a rudder on a ship to steer it. We put bits in a horse's mouth to control it. There's the book of James that says, but the tongue is a fire that's set by the fires of hell and who can control it. So when I begin to fast and pray, I take authority over the one thing that has the greatest power to destroy me, my tongue. And when I take authority over my tongue and my desires, I come out of the wilderness and the power of the Spirit, and He's put a new heart and a new mouth. That's why when you see Jesus in the book of Revelation, it says that He had a fiery sword coming out of His mouth. So what happens is God gives you the ability to be able to speak with such authority in the realm of the Spirit that you can divide between joints and marrow, soul and spirit, and begin to command things to come to pass in the realm of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's sing this little song. How many of you today say, Pastor Nev, I'm going to join you in a fast? How many of you say, Pastor Nev, I'm going to join you in the fast? So, So if you'll just fill out the little card, and then what we'll do is in tonight's service, just come, and we're going to anoint people for the, for the fast tonight, in tonight's service. And we begin, uh, if you say, well, Pastor, never, I've already got food cooking at home today, that's fine. Um, the Bible says the evening and the morning were the first day. That's how the Jewish calendar worked. God begins at night, the evening. God doesn't begin in the morning. The first day, God, the evening and the morning of the first day. So God works exactly opposite to what we work. And so we begin tonight at sunset and just say, all right now, Lord, we're setting ourselves to fast and pray. And uh, we're agreeing for a miracle. So I want you to just lay your hands on yourself right now. Father, you said if we, your people, would humble ourselves and pray, you'll heal our land. Our nation needs to be healed. You said in Malachi that the son of righteousness would rise with healing in his wings. And we need you to arise in our nation. We need you to arise in our family. We need you to arise in every area that we're dealing with. So Lord, we come and we lay aside every weight that so easily inhibits us and besets us and slows us down from achieving our purpose. Just like you came and said to Daniel, I came because you prayed. I've come to give you skill and strength. I've come to answer your prayer. So I declare that angels will be released during this period of the fast. I declare that problems that have been unsolved will be resolved. I declare that where the enemy has come to bankrupt men and women, that you will restore finance to them supernaturally. I declare that families that have been broken will be restored, that children that are part of families in this church that are bound by drugs and violence and in broken homes, that they will be restored, that in each and every area we see your mighty hand revealed in Jesus' mighty and wonderful name. Now, Lord, as we lay our hands upon ourselves, we thank you that just as Abraham laid Isaac on the altar, We present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to you. I thank you. You protect everyone on the fast. No one becomes ill. I thank you supernaturally. No one becomes ill. Health brings and light breaks out in Jesus' mighty and wonderful name. And the people of God said amen. I'm Pastor Nev from Good Hope Christian Center, and I want you to know that God loves you, and we're sharing what we're sharing so that you know how to overcome and win this war that we're currently facing and come out victorious. God bless you. Amen.